love, who learns good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. To make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glory of the of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food. Open your hand to satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all the flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. The word of the Lord. The lesson is from 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? The word of the Lord. Please stand and read the gospel.
uh, Avery, uh, Emery Joel was born. Emery Joel, three pounds and nine ounces. Uh, so very small, very early. She must have been just incredibly anxious to get into the world and meet her parents. Uh, but of course, as you know, there's some sensitivity uh, to be born that early, and so the baby was actually flown uh, to Sioux Falls, and I believe is in a neck unit now, uh, but it's doing very well. Uh, but we keep uh, Emory, uh, certainly Justin and Carly in our prayers um, in, in the coming weeks uh, as, uh, as we pray for uh, her well-being. Um, well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our precious Lord and Savior, Christ. We, uh, we've been thinking about together uh, during this season of Lent what it means to grow in love and, and what that means. And it seems like whenever we talk about love, we have to talk about relationships because you can't, you can't talk about love without relationships. You can't talk about relationships without love. They, they, they intertwine with one, one another. Love is always thought about and talked about in a, in a relational way. Love has a story. There, there are connections. It's, uh, it's not simply love isn't just something, something that we hold on to, but it's something that we give. We, we, we open ourselves and we share love. So in that sense, it endures as long as relationships endure. In fact, an ancient church father, Augustine, talked about how love surrounds us, but that there can be of ordered loves in our lives, and there can be disordered loves in our lives as well. So we don't, when we don't put our loves in the proper order, then we become, then we become dis, disordered. Uh, which for Augustine, uh, ordered love was placing God as our first love. That is an ordered love. God is always first and foremost the first love of our heart. And the promise of the scriptures is that even though we cannot always generate this type of love that is embodied in putting God first, um, and it's embodied in the Shema, we've been reciting that, um, we cannot always live into the Shema. I mean, we, I mean, we have to confess that this is a difficult thing to do, to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Certainly, it's difficult to always be loving our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, so, uh, to generate this uh, type of love, to embody this type of love, uh, we need always to think of God's love. That's that's ordering our lives correctly. The great church father Augustine would say. But having said that, let's let's recite the Shema again together. Maybe that's uh, been kind of our uh, passage through these. Of Lent. So are you ready? Let's say it together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. So Augustine would say disordered love focuses not on God, but disordered love generally focuses on me and myself. Disordered love focuses on, on us, but ordered love, ordered love, the kind of love scripture is talking about focuses on God and God's infinite love for all, for you and and for me. So our first passage makes us aware that we don't always share this love or live into this love, but before we dwell there, we must be ordered and centered on the love of God, on all the ways that God is faithful, on all the ways that God is gracious, on all the ways that God is loving and gracious. The source of our love doesn't come from the perception we have of ourselves or others, it doesn't come from the image we project in the world or the one in the mirror looking back at us. It's never projected in those things. It's not found in books, not even, no, not even this book. Though this is a helpful book, but it's not found in books. It's not found in, 
in our movies, it's not found in our music. This love is found in God. That is the only sure and certain place that we can find this love. The love of God. So that is always where we begin. Something that I have been good at reminding all of you about these weeks of, of Lent. So I just thought I would start there. Now some of you know that I've been laid up for a couple of days this past week and so I, I took the opportunity because frankly I could do nothing else but just listen to my computer. And so I, I decided that I would download some sermons. And, uh, and so that's what I did literally for two days. I listened to other preachers and uh, to hopefully become a better preacher myself. But one of the one of the sermons I listened to was a sermon that Mark Luther King Jr. gave uh, just weeks before he died. And it's called The Drama Major Instinct. I don't know, maybe some of you have heard about that. The Drama Major Instinct. Instinct. And in it he actually gives instructions. He gives instructions about what he wanted people to say at his funeral. Mind you, he didn't know he was going to die a few weeks later. But in this sermon, he was giving instructions for what he wanted people to say at his funeral. He said he didn't want to talk, he didn't want people to talk about him by his fame or to talk about his achievements. As Martin Luther King Jr. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for the crying out loud. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't want people to talk about that at his funeral. What he, what he said in the sermon is that what he wanted people to say about him at his funeral was that Martin Luther King Jr. just tried to love somebody. That he just spent his life trying to love somebody. That's all he wanted others to know about him. So I think that could be true of us, particularly our journey now this Lent as we're focusing on growing in, in the love of God. And I don't know why I was thinking about that, maybe because I thought I was dying when I was sick, uh, but don't we want people to know or maybe to say at our funeral that we just tried to love, we just tried to be a loving person in this life, and we tried to grow in this love. If people could say that at your funeral, if people could say that at my funeral, then I would say we're pretty successful. Pretty successful. No matter how many years we've been blessed to live. Just that we try to love somebody. So I guess that sums up about what we're about. So we've talked about how we can grow in that love by our words. We've talked about how we can grow in that love by our serving. We've talked about how we can grow in that love simply by giving time to the ones that we want to love. Because when it comes to time, we're going to disappoint someone or something, aren't we? And we don't want to disappoint the ones that we love in this life. And so this week, so we talked about all those, those things. This week, we just want to focus on giving. And it, that sounds kind of you know broad, and indeed it is all of those things that we talked about, you know, giving an encouraging word. We give service to each other, we give time. They're all about giving, but I want to I just kind of narrow that, what it means to actually give, because love gives, so we want to consider that today. Probably the most famous verse in the Bible, a lot of people know, it's in the Gospel of John, it's in the third chapter, the 16th verse, so let's just put it up on the screen, and maybe we can just say it together. And you probably even have to look at the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his own son. So that the world believes in him and not perish, but may have eternal life. So God loves, right? And God gives. God loves the world so much that God gave his son. That's, that's how it works. Because loving gives. When you, when you love, you're, you're just a giving person. Because giving heals, and giving bonds, and giving connects, and giving 
gives life. And giving is just the best way to live. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the, the priest didn't get that. The priest didn't give anything in the story. The Levite didn't give anything in the story. In fact, what does Jesus tell us? That they just, the religious elite just walked by the person that was bruised on the side of the road. But the Good Samaritan stopped and gave. Gave something. Gave, gave the innkeeper even two denarii to, to take care of this man. And he said, whatever else you spend, I'll, I'll give to you. I'll, I'll repay you. Because giving heals, giving bonds, giving connects, giving gives life. Giving is just the best way to live. And we're focused on giving this week, um, this message of, of giving. And, and I find it really kind of interesting. Every time when couples get married, they usually give each other something, right? They give each other, they give each other rings. Why do we do that? Why do we give? Why do we give each other rings? Uh, the engagement ring that I got for Emily because I was in grad school, I was in seminary. You know, I had no money. I, I gave her a diamond, and it kind of came with its own insurance policy because if it fell out, it was so small, you didn't even know it was gone. You didn't even know it was, you didn't even know it was missing, right? Um, it had its own insurance policy, but um, that's a gift that couples give, and, and it's not about the cost. Right, honey? It's not. It's, gifts are not about how much they cost. Um, a gift is a symbol, right? A gift is an expression. It's, it's not about how much it costs, though it seemed that, at least for me, it cost a lot at the time, uh, but it's a gift. It's a concrete way of saying and declaring, I love you, or I think about you, or I'll be there for you, or I'll, I'll care about you. You're not alone. Love gives. Love always gives. The scripture quotes these words as being from Jesus. It's the next one, and we'll put it up on the screen. And you've probably heard this before. Jesus said that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And this is kind of a lost beatitude. It's a, it's a blessing. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Because giving makes us capable of receiving in the truest sense. A hand that will not open to give cannot and will not receive anything. So the giving way is heaven's way of life. It's God's way. God gave us everything we have. In the giving of himself, God realized his own greatest joy and highest glory. The giving way is Jesus' way of life. The verse, it is more blessed to give than to receive, is really just a transcript of Jesus' life. If you read the Gospels, this is from, this is from Acts, but if you read the Gospels, Jesus is never quoted as saying this. But Jesus didn't have to be quoted in saying this because this is what Jesus lived. He lived that it's more blessed to give than to receive. This was the transcript of his life. He had a right to speak these words because this was the voice of experience talking. He knew all about getting just as he knew all about giving. He had received. He had received everything from his father. He had received everything from eternity as no one other ever received. And Jesus had given. In Matthew 20, 28, it says, and we have this on the screen, the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. So nobody had received more, nobody had given more than this Jesus. Jesus knew all about receiving and he knew all about giving and he put the two things in the scales over against each other and he stood back and you know what he said? He said, this one giving is bigger and better and more divine than getting. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So much he even commands others, and he models and teaches this giving, and not just to give to people who can give back to you. Jesus expands, and Jesus says, God, I want you to give even when it's not to your advantage, even when you know you can get nothing in return. I still want you to be a giving person. 
fact, Jesus actually gives priority to gifts that would go to those who could not pay you back. And he knows he has to overturn a big entrenched system. That's what is behind words like this from Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So now is Jesus saying here that it's a sin to have your relatives over for dinner? Is that what Jesus is saying here? That you're not to invite your in-laws or any of your relatives over to dinner? Well, yes, this is exactly what Jesus is saying. Don't invite your relatives over for dinner. Some of you have waited for this scripture text to be revealed to you for a long time. Are you glad you came to church? To discover that, right? No, that's not what that's not what Jesus is saying. Of course you're gonna have your relatives over for dinner. Of course you're gonna have your good friends over for dinner. Of course you're gonna have your neighbors over for dinner. Of course you're gonna invite your pastor over for dinner. Of course you're gonna do these things, right? But Jesus says, I want you to invite the lame and the crippled and the blind. I want you to give so that you cannot be repaid for your giving, and they will be blessed. That's what Jesus says. He's saying that, in fact, when you give to the poor, you are somehow giving to God Himself. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and my sisters of mine, you did it unto me. So this is the repayment. That we, when we give to those who cannot repay, we are giving to God. And this is revolutionary. For example, James writes a letter, and this is in the New Testament. He says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. And he writes this. James says that don't be deceived because the people were being deceived about giving. Because they felt like the only time that they should give is when they know that they're going to get something back. So James says, don't be deceived about this. Don't be deceived about this. Don't fall back into that old pattern of only giving to get. James says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. You see, that humbles us. And that levels each of us. Now we are all alike receivers of God's unceasing gifts. And now we give because of this. And the giving doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to cost lots of money. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to say love. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And that statement is as important for marriages as it is for families, as it is for our children, as it is for our parents, as it is for our grandparents, as it is for our friendships, and our neighbors, and our relationships, and our workplaces, and certainly in our church. And it certainly is important for our own financial stewardship. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, a gift doesn't have to cost anything. You know, sometimes gifts can just be fun, can't they? You know, a buddy of mine, he'll send a cartoon to me, he'll text it to me, or he'll email me a, or he'll email, email me a joke. And they're never jokes that I can use in the pulpit, so they're really useless jokes. So. But, but it's a simple gift, right? It's certainly giving me something, and it's showing that he's thinking about me, or send, sending me an article, or, or he says, well, I read this book, why don't you read this book? You know, so I think it's just getting a physical expression from somebody is a gift. And it can be as simple as an email or a text message or a card in the mail. It tells you that somebody's caring about you. Another thing that you can do is that you can just, you can, you can be like a giving detective. You can be 
feel like I can give him to, to be on the lookout for clues about what somebody in your life really cares about, and then give it to them. You know, if you go shopping, you know, somebody might have their eye on a scarf or something, or maybe on a piece of music, or, or you know, maybe it's a, a blouse or a, you know, a pair of shorts or something. You know? and, and they just say, oh, I really like that, or I really like that music, and then all of a sudden that gift shows up to them on their birthday or at Christmas, or, or it just shows up to them the next day just for no reason at all. That's how, that's how, you, that's how you give. So you can be like giving detectives. Um, you can, somebody says something like that they really love chocolate chip cookies, and then you just bake them some chocolate chip co cookies, you know? And, and you don't do this. Uh, you don't say these things, you know, just to set yourself up so you, so you use people. I mean, you're not gonna say, you know, like me, I love chocolate chip cookies, and I really love apple pie, and I don't tell you that, you know, because I'm, I'm expecting you to give me chocolate chip cookies or apple pie. I mean, that's not, that's not why we do that. those, but those things in my life, you know, great loves of mine, chocolate chip cookies and apple pie, I do love those, love those things, and uh, those are, in fact, those are two of the greatest things that I love in this life. Um, but we don't say that just because we're expecting to get those things. Do you get my drift here? I also like diamonds. Oh, so there, there, there you go. All right, here's the deal. Maybe God is calling you to like a week-long campaign of giving gifts to somebody in your life. Wouldn't that be a lot of fun just to plan that out? For seven days, just give somebody that you love one gift every day. That would be so much fun to plan out and then to, to actually actually do. And, and, and the thing is that you can do this. God has set the universe up so that you cannot authentically give without receiving. When you give, it changes the receiver. But when you give, it also changes you. And that's the greatest thing. And that's why it's more blessed to give than to receive, because it changes the giver, it changes, it changes you. So this week we focus on giving, because it's all about love, and love gives. And while I die, I would like it to be said at my funeral that he tried to love somebody. How about you? Let's stand and confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we receive our morning's offerings.